Let's uh, remain seated for just a few minutes. I want to kind of bring you up to where we've been. And as we've been studying the issue of meeting the Holy Spirit, I know a lot of you say, well, Brother Rick, we know the Holy Spirit. I, you know, I'm saved. I've been uh, saved a long time, so I know there's a Holy Spirit. Well, I'm glad you know there's one. And uh, you make it sound just like it's something that God provided for you, you know, a project. I told you the other day that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a real person. And we went through and I preached at great length all the qualities and characteristics and attributes that the Spirit of God has as a person, not as a human being, but as a person that has a personality. We then stepped into the arena of realizing He's not just a person, He's a divine person, which means He's part of what the Lord refers to in the Scriptures as the Godhead. And in the Godhead, we found out that there's three personalities in the Godhead. Not three gods, one God, three different personages. And one is God the Father, the other is God the Son, and the other is God the Holy Spirit. The problem is, in most churches, we, we focus on two-thirds of the Godhead. We, we look at the Holy Spirit, again, as an unction. We look at the Holy Spirit as a juice. We look at the Holy Spirit as the plug-in and that we're the conduit. And because of the things that he's associated with in Scripture, we don't take those associations off of him. When we say the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And so we see the dove and we think, oh, the Holy Spirit. He's a found feathered friend, right? Uh, uh, no, he's, he's God. He's a divine person. He is, he's just as much God as God the Father and God the Son. And so you have, and Jesus even referred to him as the Holy Ghost. And because of that phrase and our upbringing, we usually tend to run away from that word. Baptists are scared of the word ghost because the Scripture tells us not to have nothing to do with them kind of spirits. And so when you start talking about spirit, listen, the Bible says God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you got a problem there. Because you can't wrap your hands around it and you can't get your mind to set on the Spirit of God, we kind of just ignore Him. And that's a sorry, sorry excuse for not praising God. We just ignore. We just kind of go with the flow. We just kind of don't acknowledge Him. We don't address Him. We don't really, honestly, appreciate Him. And so we found out as we were looking at the last couple of lessons that he's not just a person, he's a divine person, but he's a comforting person. And the, word you, the, the, the Greek word that Jesus used there was paraclete. He's a paraclete. He, he's, he's someone who is an advocate for you. He's a helper for you. He's one who stands and comes along beside you. And Jesus used another word, no pun intended. Just before he said comforter, he said another comforter. And he used the word that meant another just like me. Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter. Then in that same sentence of Scripture in John, he says, I'm going to send you another comforter. And then he says later, and I will come unto you. Well, how's he going to come unto me if he's sending me a comforter? Because they're one. He's talking about being indwelt. Do you realize we, we say it all the time, and it makes sense, but it's theologically, actually incorrect. I asked Jesus into my heart. Did you? Well, yes. And did he come? Well, yes. Are you sure? Well, yes, he said he was going to come. We are indwelt by what? The Spirit of God. But since you can't separate God, guess what? The Godhead. But we don't realize that we are indwelt by the power of the presence of Almighty God. He comes among us. And so this morning I want to look at a, 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 a three phrases that are found about the Holy Spirit. And again, we're going to be spending a lot of time in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 because that's where Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to us. Remember, the Holy Spirit introduced God the Father. God the Father introduced God the Son. And now God the Son has introduced God the Holy Spirit. And as he did so, he, he uses a couple of phrases about him. And I want to break it down so you can already figure out it's probably going to be two to three weeks on just these three phrases. Aren't you glad I can preach fast? 
Somebody told me the other day, I'm so glad you're so shallow of a preacher. You don't, you don't dig into nothing, amen? Bless God, when I pitch a tent, the peg sometimes is 50 foot long, amen? The phrases are very simple. The phrases are in realizing that the Holy Spirit is with you, the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit can come upon you. I know what you're thinking on those last two. Well, if he's in me, how can he come upon me? We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. The phrase that I want to come up with this morning is, I want you to realize something very, very important. In John chapter 14, let's stand together for the Scriptures. You will notice that he wants to have a relationship. The Holy Spirit wants to have a relationship with you, and that's why you hear that word you so often. He's talking about Jesus, was, is, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he says, and this he wants to do with you, and this with you, and you, and you. It's a relationship that he wants to build with you. And so in John chapter 14, verse number 16, the scripture is Jesus again saying some familiar words that I've read to you all several weeks. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Look at chapter 15 and verse number 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John chapter 16, verse number 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. You can be seated. Now, we have going to look at this little phrase of this morning of the Holy Spirit being with you. And as we start looking and realizing that the Holy Spirit is with us, we're going to focus on John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. It tells us two special words. He says that he is going to abide with you, and then it says he's going to dwell with you. Now, in that same portion of Scripture, the next thing is what we'll preach next time. He will be, what? In you. So right now, the Holy Spirit, in this ministry that Jesus is saying, when he comes, this is going to be part of the earthly ministry of the Holy Spirit. What is that earthly ministry going to be? He is going to be with me. He's going to be with you. He's going to abide with you. Now, the question is, if he's going to abide with you, who's you? Who, who is the Holy Spirit going to dwell with? If he's not in you, that means he's outside of you, which means you're not saved if he's not in you. So he must be going to what? Abide and dwell with all men on the face of the earth. Lost included. You, aren't you glad of that? Because guess what? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And no man comes to the Father unless you be drawn to the Father. The Holy Spirit is that drawing force. Why? Because he's abiding around us and he's dwelling with us. Do you realize what the Holy Spirit's ministry is right now with all men? Do you realize because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, we do not have the presence of the Antichrist? The world is wicked, is it not? 
But because the Holy Spirit is here, and He's indwelling believers, and the Spirit of God is present on the face of this earth, guess what? This world is not as bad as it could be. And when the rapture takes place, guess what? This world is going to become as bad as it can be. Look at your news right now. And you're turning it off. Guess what? It's only going to get worse. And the only reason it's not just all hell breaking loose and the demonic presence of the demons are running wild is because of what the Apostle Paul shared with the church of Thessalonica. They thought they had missed the rapture. They thought the day of the Lord had come and things are bad. I guess so. Now, I've come into the building before, and Paul wasn't here, and I got worried. I'm thinking rapture took place, and I missed it. But I've come into the church, and Russell wasn't here, and it didn't bother me a bit. I knew the rapture hadn't happened. But the apostle Paul said to this church, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by your gathering together unto him. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 that ye be not so soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by your spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Don't let anything worry you that the day of the Lord is at hand because it's not there yet, because certain things haven't happened yet. Listen, don't let false prophets worry you about the coming of the Lord. Brother Cruz shared with me an idiot the other day on, the, on, on YouTube, and he said, you've got to just watch this. And so I watched some of it, and it's hilarious, his logic, that the Lord's coming in 2028, and he's got all the proof in the world. And he even went to the Scripture that says, I know that's the truth because I'm not claiming the day of the hour. Because the Bible says no man can know the day of the hour, but we can know the year. Using that same idiotic logic, I can know the minute and the second then. So why don't he pinpoint it a little better? False prophets are everywhere. Jesus will come when Jesus is ready to come. And the Bible is showing us through all the signs and wonders and the shadows of the signs, it's going to be soon. Things are lining up real well according to the Scripture. Instead of turning your TV off, open your Bible and start showing them, look at this, look at this. And that's good stuff. But what's going to happen? He said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that the day of the Lord shall not come, except there come a falling away first. That beginning to happen? That beginning to happen? Schools are being sued right now because of something called the Good News Club that has infiltrated all kind of uh, schools, in fact, even those here locally. And it's a Bible study class that happens at schools in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that have been known. Guess who's now on the fort? The Church of Satan says we want to come in too. Based on the same reason we want to come in too. So what's that going to force? It's going to force that we either let them or that we pull out. We retreat. Then all of a sudden you got things going on and, and you got like the good news clubs. And what do they, if we decide, okay, let's get involved in that ministry, which we have been invited to. Then I have to say to you as a congregation, who will volunteer for that? Who will take one hour a week and go down to Wilkinson Elementary School? Who will take two hours a week and go down to Clay Hill uh, Elementary School. Or maybe just two hours a month. Who would do that? Well, preacher, I don't know if I can do it. There shall be a great falling away. Right? Even well-meaning people are beginning to pull away. Even count on in the spot church members are beginning to pull away that's crucial folks why do you think brother Darrell the Lord has laid on his heart on Wednesday nights to talk about fellowship because fellowship in Christ 
brings us to fellowship with Christians and we become a strong army of the Lord. We become a family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And what does that do? We strengthen one another. We lift up one another. We encourage one another. Because why? There's going to be a great falling away, but it doesn't have to happen at Clay Hill Baptist Church. And then he says, and then after that, thank God you and I will not be here because of other scriptures say this, the, son, the, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. That We find that out in the book of Revelation in the middle part of the tribulation. He says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Can I ask you a question? When you get worried about some of the things that's going on in the earth, and you get worried about some things, let me ask you a question. Do you not remember what I've taught you? That's what Paul's asking them. Don't you remember? We did a series on that. I, I preached a sermon on that. There were some Sunday school lessons on that. Don't you remember that? And that's when the Holy Spirit will come and bring it back to your remembrance, and you can have peace in the midst of absolute turmoil. But watch this now. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What's holding that Antichrist back? What's holding that Antichrist from coming on the earth right now and taking power? He may, and I assume he, it has to be so, in my personal opinion, that's First Crusalonians, he's alive today. You say, well, what would make you say that? If I believe in the second coming is imminent, and if Jesus Christ calls us home this afternoon, guess who's there? Guess who's stepping up? The Antichrist. So if I believe that Jesus is coming soon and very soon, then I also believe the Antichrist is walking around on the earth today. Well, why hasn't he gotten his power? Why hasn't he stepped up? Why hasn't he assumed things? Why hasn't he started putting Christians in prison? Why isn't he doing the mark of the beast? Why not? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Why? The Holy Spirit's here. And that's the only reason this world has not been consumed by evil. Evil is all around us, but he who will let, will let it. He who will allow, will allow. He who holds back he who restrains the evil one. He who restrains wickedness. Now, that does not mean he's not letting you be the person you are. He's not stepping in, and, and, and you can never say these words, the Spirit made me do it, amen? <laughs> Just like you can't say what? The devil made me do it. You have a free will and a free moral agency about you, and you make choices. But thanks be to God, those choices are there. You have the choice of evil and wickedness that dwells within you because you are a sinner. And that choice could come out, or the restraining power of wickedness around us, the Holy Spirit can restrain your choices. He can hold back. What else does he do? We find out in chapter 15, verse 26, he shall testify of me. He will testify of me. He proclaims Jesus. Anytime you see a ministry talking more about the Spirit of God than the Son of God, walk away. Well, Brother Rick, there's no, you're trying to get us to talk to the Holy Spirit. You're trying, I'm trying to tell you to give him equal balance. I'm trying to tell you to use what's available inside of you as a believer. I'm trying to show you how to become more connected with the holy God of heaven. Isn't that what you really want? A better relationship with the Lord? A better relationship with people? Until the rapture takes place? Isn't that what we desire? Well, then guess what? The Holy Spirit is here to restrain wickedness and to, to push back evil. He's also here to proclaim Jesus. How does he proclaim Jesus? You ever thought about that? 
How, how does the Holy Spirit proclaim? He doesn't drop down. I've never seen a dove talk. And I don't believe half of what parrots say. And cockatiels are just weird. So, so what is it that, how does he speak? Well, the first thing he did is found in 2 Peter chapter two or chapter 1. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What did he do? How does he proclaim Jesus? To Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul, Moses, and Ezekiel, and Daniel. He came over them and whispered in their ear, Thus saith the Lord. And they wrote what we hold in our Bible, in our hand this morning, called the Bible. He proclaims Jesus because he gave us his word. The Bible says, and I've said this so many times this week, or this series, that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And what happened? All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration. It's God-breathed. You hold in your hand the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of Almighty God. And where did it come from? The Spirit of God moved men so that they would write it using their own personality. Aren't you glad He uses your own personality? All these cults try to get you all to be the same, amen? Look the same, walk the same, dress the same. Listen, I've watched some of you dress. I don't want to do that. Amen? There, there are some things I, ju I just don't want to do. I'm, they will never call us a cult, amen? We got too many pinions around here. And that's cool. That's fine. That's wonderful. But the Holy Spirit moved using their own personality to write a perfect word from God. He provides Scripture. He also provides preachers. The, the book of Romans, Paul asks the question, for whosoever, or makes a statement, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad of that? That God will save anybody and everybody that calls on His name. Boy, I, I, I love that. But here's the problem. How then shall they call on Him who they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. What does he do? Remember, we've already shared with you in the book of Acts, what did he say? Philip, go over here. What did he say? I want you to separate me, Paul and Barnabas, to the ministry in which I have called them. Notice what God has done. He has called preachers to stand and preach and testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he also said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Who's that? That's a commission given to the church, not to the preacher. So that's the way he's testifying. He uses preachers, and he uses people in the church. And he proclaims the scriptures that he wrote. How does the Holy Spirit move? The Word of God. Claim the wonderful promise. My Word will not return unto me void. But how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they know unless they're sent? Sent by the Spirit of God and sent by the church of God. How does this happen? What's going on? What does the Holy Spirit do? He pushes back evil. He proclaims the truth of God. To who? All men. Saved and lost. And by the way, we were all what at one time? Lost. And the Holy Spirit had a ministry to me. He didn't allow me to become centered in an environment that is so wicked, I had no choice but wickedness. And he restrains the evil one. He pushes him away. And then he proclaims, How can I know I can be saved? How do I really know Jesus loves me? <laughs> you know, Jesus loves me. This I know. Go ahead. For the Bible tells me so. 
You say, why do you teach that to kids so young? Because it's so true. And they need it for the rest of their life. I loved when I started that song. Because some, some of the children in here began to lift up their grin. Like, I know what he's going to say next. That's good because most people never know what I'm going to say next. I don't never know what I'm... But not only did I get a grin from them, I got a grin from some of you older folks. Because you knew what I was going to say too. Whether you're three or 83, it brings a grin to your face to know, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Holy Spirit made it so. He made me to know that because he provided scriptures. He made me know that because he provides preachers. He made me know that because he provides people to share their faith with me. Not only that, what else does he do? In chapter 16, verse number 8, he pursues men. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's an interesting word, reprove. It's translated numerous different ways, but one of the most common elements is the idea of reproving means to convict, to convince over, to convince a true declaration. You see, we, we look at the other end of conviction. We say the Holy Spirit is here to reprove or convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so we look at that as, oh, okay, that means the Holy Spirit's here to make me feel bad. He's here to point out my sin. He's here to say, ah, don't you do that. He's here to convict me. He's here to make that weird feeling come in my stomach when the preacher happens to say what I'm guilty of last week. And I think, usually, you know what you think? I've had so many people walk out of this door, and I've, I've been in the ministry, oh my goodness, forever. And as we look at those years in the ministry, I realize something. I don't think I've ever had anybody say what should be said to me on the way out the door. But I've had them say stuff like this. How did you know? You were preaching straight to me. Have you been following me? Only on Facebook. When they know what the truth is, how did the Spirit know? How did the Holy Spirit know to lay on your heart that sermon that I needed because I was going to be here and you had no clue I was going to be here. You had no clue what I needed. But guess what? Has he been following me around? And the answer is yes. Because he dwells and he abides. Now, if you're saved, he's in. But we'll talk about that next time. But if you're lost, yes. He's been following you around. He pursues you. He looks for you. And when he gets close to you, he begins to reprove or convict you. Now, see, the word convict there from God's perspective is not the idea of ours. I have a conviction about that. That means i got a firm stand and I'm sold on that idea. Okay, well, that's part of what the word convict means. The other part is a legal term. Have you ever met somebody who's been convicted? Chances are they were in jail. Because once you're convicted, that means you're found what? Guilty. So the Holy Spirit of God isn't just making you feel uncomfortable. The reason you feel uncomfortable is not what you're thinking it is. Oh, he's making it uneasy for you. He's really convicted me, isn't he? No, what he's telling you is you're guilty. You are guilty before a holy God. You see, he didn't come just to make you feel uncomfortable so maybe you would do something different. He came to convict you so you would say, Oh my, <laughs> I am in a mess. I am before God guilty. Notice the first thing he says you're guilty of? There's, there's three areas that he points out. That he exposes them. He, he's there to refute them. I, I love what one writer said. He's there to undeceive the world. Because we've been deceived about some things, haven't we? we? We look at areas, and when the first area he looks at is sin. He reproves or convicts about sin. Isn't it interesting? Sin, when he does that, is the truth about man. What is man? 
sinner. When he convicts of sin, he's trying to show you something. You are guilty of sin. The second thing he convicts of is righteousness. You know what righteousness is? The truth about God. Do you realize something this morning? God is guilty of being righteous. That is an emphatic proof that has been proven without a shadow of doubt, beyond all reasonable doubt, God is righteous. You are sinful. He's convicting you this morning, and he convicts the world this morning that men are sinful and God is righteous. Then he convicts of judgment. <laughs> Do you know what judgment is? Judgment is when sin meets righteousness and there's condemnation because sin can't stand up to righteousness. So what does he say in chapter 16, verse number 9? He says, he convicts us of sin. Aren't you glad the Bible's the best commentary? Well, what does he mean, Brother Rick? Well, just read. Amen? He convicts of sin because he tells the truth. Here it is. Do you know why the Holy Spirit is convicting of sin? He's convicting of sin because they believe not on me. That proof right there is who's he talking to. When I asked you a while ago, who's he abiding with? People who don't believe in him. Who's he dwelling with? People who do not believe in him. Who's he pursuing? People who do not believe in him. Who's he convicting? People who do not believe in him. You see, who's he proclaiming the word of God to? People who do not believe in him. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to convict them of sin. Notice he does not say sins. He says sin singular. Do you realize there's only, you ready for this? One sin. The others are sins. The others are things we do because we're sinners. But this is what makes us a sinner. We're born sinners who are dead in our trespasses and in sin. Jesus said in John chapter 3, those who believe not are condemned already. In chapter 5, Jesus said, they do not believe on me. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, they do not believe on me. John chapter 14, Jesus said, they do not believe on me. Matthew writes, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Brother Rick, isn't that what we call the unpardonable sin? Yes. What is it? Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. What is that? Resisting his convicting truth that you are guilty of sin, and that sin is you don't believe in Jesus Christ, therefore I will not forgive you in this world or in the world to come, no matter how many times a Mormon gets baptized for you. He will not forgive anyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ as the Bible portrays him. That's strong words. It says that the Spirit of God does not merely accuse men of sin, he brings them to an inescapable sense of guilt so that they realize their shame and helplessness before God. I've been reading a lot about counseling and mental health, and uh, counselors have all come to an agreement that I disagree with. Imagine that. Their agreement is you shouldn't make people feel guilty. Guilt is a horrible emotion. And I say to you, you are exactly right if they're not guilty. To feel guilt and shame over something you haven't done. The poor teenage girl who's been raped and feels guilt and shame. And some idiot will come along and say, well, you see what she was wearing, don't you? She deserved it. She was asking for it. Two words for him. Moron. That is not true. That is evil. And I 100% believe that if you are not guilty, 
guilt is a horrible thing to feel. Children who live in a separated home oftentimes feel it was their fault. Mom and dad are splitting up. It's mom and dad's fault. Face it. Go ahead and suck it up and look at reality. But if you're guilty, you need to know you're guilty. And so the Holy Spirit of God says, guess what? You don't believe in Jesus? You are guilty of a sin that will separate you from a holy God forever and ever. That's what he's all about. Then he convicts of righteousness. That's an interesting phrase. Of righteousness, look again, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. What's, what's he saying? When Jesus walked on this earth, what did he portray to all mankind? His righteousness. Did Jesus ever do anything wrong? Nope. He was perfect. He was holy. He is righteous. He says, I'm going to leave here, and you'll see me no more. I'm going to convict you of righteousness because I've set the standard for righteousness. The problem is you can't look at me. You have to ask the question, what would Jesus do? My disciples got to see what Jesus did. And they got to see the standard for righteousness. What is the standard for righteousness? Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They've missed the mark. What's the mark? Jesus. You, the average man, <laughs> the standard for righteousness is himself. I'm not as bad as this person. I may not be perfect, but <laughs> our standard for righteousness is unrighteousness. We, we seem to think if, if we aren't as unrighteous as this person, then I'm righteous. No, you're just not as evil as that person. But the answer to that is, you could be. It lies within each and every one of us who are sinners and dead in trespasses and in sin. Every sin out there, as wicked and evil as it may be, you and I could have committed. No doubt in my mind. We are sinners. And He is righteous. There are none righteous, no, not one. All your righteousness is as filthy rags. All we like sheep have gone astray. There are none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then I've got a real problem about this righteousness thing. If I say, okay, I know I'm a sinner, and you've convicted me of that sin, what do I do? You better understand something. As a sinner, you've got to approach a holy God. I can't approach a holy God. You're exactly right. So what am I going to do? What's the Holy Spirit doing? He's pushing away evil, but he's pulling in righteous. He's trying to get you to see Christ. And look at what happens. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For he hath made him to be what? Sin for us. What am I? What am I being convicted of? Sin. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Holy Spirit of God is trying to tell me, you are a sinner. He is righteous. He died for your sin. He took your place. If you'll receive that, I'll put on His righteousness before you. And guess what that'll do? That'll make judgment a whole lot different. I will then convict of judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world is judged. <laughs> you do understand something. If God is going to judge the highest ranking and most beautiful angel of glory, Lucifer, who fell and we call him the old dragon, we call him the devil, we call him Satan, we know for a fact the Bible says he will be judged and he will be cast into the lake of fire. He will go to a place called hell that the Bible says the Lord prepared for the devil and his angels. We know that. Better yet, he knows that. But right now, he's the prince in the power of the air. But one day, it's already secured in heaven. 
How do I know it's secured in heaven? Because on the cross, the Bible says that Jesus took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. How do I know? It says in Hebrews 2 that Jesus on the cross destroyed the power of death. In Colossians 2, he says, the cross took away all the, the elements of principalities and empowers. In Genesis, he said that his head was going to be crushed. We know it's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen. The only thing that we don't know is you. Now, I know about me. I took care of it when I was 14 years old. The judgment of my sin... The conviction of my sin that I am a sinner, I do not believe in Jesus Christ. And yet he is righteous. And that righteousness would become sin for me. And I could become the righteousness of God in him. And when I stand in the day of judgment, I will not hear the words, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Holy Spirit is here, dwells with us. He abides with us. He wants one other thing to happen. John chapter 16, and I'll conclude. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, He shall speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. What's he doing? What's the Holy Spirit doing? Right now, what's he doing while he's dwelling among us? He's looking for one who needs to be pursued. And he's going to push away evil so that it doesn't get as wicked as it could around you. And he's going to have the word of God proclaimed to you. He's going to have a preacher te testify to you about Jesus Christ. What's he going to do? He's going to draw you near, and then he's going to tell you about sin. What sin? Just one. Well, Brother Rick, I do this, and I forget all that. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? That's all we want. That's all. The rest of it, he'll talk to you about later. He can't clean something that's not his. You say, well, I want to stop doing this before I come to him. You'll never come to him. You don't have the power to clean yourself up. If I had the power to clean myself up, you would pray to me because I'd be God. But I'm not. <laughs> I am definitely not God. But he wants to convict, show us we are guilty of sin, of unbelief. We are guilty of of realizing we are not righteous, but God is righteous. We are guilty in a judgment that will come before a holy, a holy God one day. And Holy Spirit, what are you doing right now? I'm going to guide you. I'm telling you right now. Listen to the Spirit. What's he saying? I, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven. I, I really, I'm kind of scared about this stuff. You're talking about hell and burning up and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Preachers, I, that scares me when preachers talk like that. I have to. I have to tell you the truth. And if you do not know Jesus as your if you've never accepted him, you go, well, what does that mean? Then if you don't know what that means, in a moment, the video is going to play, some music is going to play, you come and you meet me at the altar, and I'll have somebody take the Bible and show you how you can ask Jesus to be your Savior. Why? What's happening? He's guiding you this morning. He's guiding you this morning. You say, Brother Rick, you didn't preach on it, but he's in me. Then guess what he's also doing? He's guiding you this morning. He's pulling you this morning. He's trying to prepare this church to do greater things than we've ever done before. He's guiding you this morning to commit to Him, to commit your life, to commit your family, to commit everything to Him and say, Okay, Lord, here am I. Send me. Whatever it is you want, whatever it is you need, I have that ability. I'll do that for you. I feel you guiding me this morning. And when God's people respond to the Holy Spirit of God, He shall glorify me. Jesus sits in heaven, interceding. And he says, Father, they just got saved. And my Bible says there shall be joy in the presence of the angels. And we often misinterpret that scripture. 
It didn't say there was going to be joy among the angels. I've heard people say, yeah, you come and ask Jesus to be your Savior, and the angels of glory are going to shout for joy. They might. But what's in the presence of the angels? Jesus, the Father. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to have joy. There's joy in the presence of the angels. You want to make God happy this morning? Receive his son. You want to please the Father this morning? You want to glorify Jesus this morning? Let the Spirit of God guide you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come, O Holy Spirit. Move me. Holy Father, Father,